Hello everybody, my name is Max Mick, and today I'm going to be bringing you a draft guide for Midnight Hunt uh, for Arena. Uh, normally I draft on Magic Online, and I have some win rate statistics to brag about, which you know about if you watched me before, but I don't this time. All I've got, I guess, is that I climbed from Bronze to Mythic in about a week, only not seven winning three drafts. I don't, I don't know if that's impressive, what, what happens on Arena, but that's what I got. Anyways, let's get into it. Uh, I wanted to start off by doing a little bit of an overview of the formats slow and fastness if that's that's not how you describe that but whatever uh and i think we'll, we'll use that a lot later on for some later arguments so uh midnight hunt is a format where you do not want to be mid-range typically you want to be using your graveyard and trying to win late games uh or being very very aggressive in rare cases either way you want your game plan to to be getting your opponent dead or your game plan to be outlasting and out resourcing your opponent <clears throat> and there's a couple reasons for that uh Mostly, the, the, the main reason is that mid-range is bad, and the aggro is weaker, and there's many less aggro cards, strong aggro cards, than there are strong synergy card advantage cards. Uh, so the base of many of these control decks that I describe is all of these self-mill value, high-value cards, and then a lot of disturbed creatures. In particular, Baytech Angler is a very, very strong disturbed creature that isn't going very late, as well as Shipwreck Sifters. And the reason that this pushes mid-range out of viability is because the upside of mid-range decks, at least the, 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 the typical mid-range deck of a curve and some removal and maybe a bomb or two, like that's what you consider a mid-range deck or whatever, at least that's what I consider a mid-range deck. The upside of those decks is you play your strong cards in the open colors and you have game against both slower decks and aggro decks by being able to play curve pieces and then go above the aggro decks, or if you play against control deck, you can go under them and be a little more aggressive, you know? But in this format, uh, the control deck should have a bunch of great two-drops uh, to block creatures. And those two-drops are also provide a lot of value. In particular, Beta Gangler, 2 mana 2 one that also is value because it makes gives you a, a 1 mana 2-1-2 two, two, uh, two mana one two flyer later on, and it's also even better anti-aggro because if they trade with it, then you can get that 1-2 flyer earlier and block with it if the 1-2 happens to be good. And I think something else about this format is that it really shows you how much value even having a shitty card like a 2-mana one 1-2 flyer in your hand has because it lets you sequence your cards more optimally and it gives you the option to play it if that's a good card or to not play it if you need something else that you can play from your hand. And the other main thing is Shipwreck Scepters. Again, if you loot away a Disturbed card, you just played a 2-mana two 2-3 two that drew you a card. Might be a shitty card, like a 5-mana 2-2 two two flyer, or a 2-mana 1-2 flyer, but it's a card nonetheless. And a 2-3, two 2-mana two 2-3 two just shuts down most aggro decks. So what's the point of playing a mid-range deck if your control decks are already as strong or stronger against the aggressive decks, and also just have late-game capabilities? And we'll, we'll extend on that later, but I think that's, that's the main argument. Um... And then the reason that aggro decks aren't as prevalent, even though there's no argument against them, is just that if you look at Mythic Spoiler or whatever, you'll see that the cards are much weaker. Uh, these were about the strongest aggro cards I could find, and they're really just not comparable to cards like Eccentric Farger Farmer and Organ Hoarder that are decent rate creatures that also draw you more than one card on average because the mailing's going to get you a Disturbed card or a Flashback card some of the time. And yeah, you can, you can play aggro. In fact, that's the only really real shell that I like playing black in, as we'll get to a little bit later. Um, but your game plan should be getting your opponent dead because you will not be beating pretty much any blue deck with any aggro deck. <laughs> and a lot of people are playing blue on Arena, <laughs> so you should be expecting that. Uh, you might have noticed that I didn't include any red cards so far, and that's because I think red's a bit of an exception to this. We're going to talk a lot about, more about this later because it's a long and complicated topic, but red I kind of consider a mid-range deck. Uh, these are the main commons that I think go into my decks, and we'll, we'll extend into why this card's playable later. Uh... But red doesn't function like a typical mid-range deck because you don't have a high creature count or a high curve. You're usually a spells deck that is trying to get your opponent dead regardless, but has the option to play a little bit slower and wait for the aggro deck to miss a beat, either by running out of cards or missing a curve piece or whatever, and then it capitalizes on that with cards like the Festival Crasher or the Tavern Ruffian and whatnot. So I don't consider that typical aggro, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, the other main pillar of the format is that splashing is very valuable. There's a lot of pretty strong cards that incidentally fix you, in primarily these three. Uh, Farmer, we already talked about, and you should know, is very strong. It also provides incidental fixing and is underrated on Arena right now. Evolving Wild's normal fixing. Uh, Jack Lantern is a big one that I think is very underrated right now, and you can build a lot of decks assuming that you're going to get one or two of this card. Uh, for one, I don't play much black, and I don't think that you should either, and black is the main card that has graveyard hate, but... 
oftentimes you might lose a mirror to another slow deck if you don't have graveyard hate because you're just going to get outvalued sometimes if you do draw poorly or whatever. And Jack O'Lantern helps a lot with that. In addition, it's fixing that works if you self-mail it. And it's hard to describe how strong that is, but it's very strong. Uh, you can just imagine all of the times that... I mean, there aren't that many times, I imagine, but... So those of you who've played a lot, that all the times where you've, you've milled your off-color basic when you have a volume wads in your deck and you're so sad that you can no longer cast your spell or whatever, uh, well, that doesn't happen anymore. Now when you mill your jack-o'-lantern, you actually get to cast your spell. It's the opposite, which is great. And then Candle Guide, not a great card, but you'll play it if you need some graveyard hate, you'll play it if you need some fixing, and it goes pretty late. Same with Mystic Skull. Uh, and the other thing that contributes to splashing being strong is all of the multicolored uncommons. The set has twice as many as normal. Uh, there's... 10 creatures that are multicolored, one in each pair. 10 spells that are multicolored, again, one in each pair. I think all of the spells actually have flashback too, which is somewhat relevant because if you're, again, trying to do jack-o'-lantern nonsense uh, and you have a lot of self-mill already, taking, like, two jack-o'-lanterns and one of any of the flashback spells has a lot more equity just because you don't even have to draw to get the value off of it. <clears throat> and that's kind of crazy if you think about it, right? Like, <laughs> you're taking an off-color card and you're getting value out of it by milling it without having to color the land in his play. It's just so low opportunity cost and so much upside, especially because there aren't that many good flashback and disturb creatures. Uh, especially if you're in a pod where people are valuing them correctly, uh, they dry up quickly, and cards like Organ Hoarder and Eccentric Farmer won't be as good because you won't have any th as many things that you actively want to mill. Uh, finally, you, you can, or I guess I was going to show you this deck. Uh, this isn't really an example of splashing multicolored cards, but it is an example of using jack o lanterns to their full extent and really pushing the limits of your different mana bases. Uh, the base of this deck is kind of green-white, kind of not, but if I wasn't splashing, this would be a very weak deck. I would have very little removal. Uh, my curve would be kind of awkward and too high in the threes, and I just wouldn't, like, I wouldn't get a lot of value off these eccentric farmers getting out lands. Whereas, by splashing, I get so much equity. I get so many strong cards to splash. I get access to a lot more removal, a lot more late game. Um, my curve improves in a sense, because Jack-O-Lantern just fills out your curve nicely, and then you're okay to spend the mana on this early because you're using that mana to get efficient removal like these two or an angel fire edition or whatever uh and it just kind of works out like like I, I was very this was my first this was actually my first try getting really really greedy with jack-o'-lanterns and evolving wilds and center farmers and everything and i was pleasantly surprised by how it worked out so i think this is just a good example of how greedy you can actually get and then obviously you could also just splash rares like you can in normal formats and if you take a look at Mythic Spoiler, like I did when I first saw Jack-O-Lantern, you will probably notice that there's not a lot of cards to splash, because a lot of the rares and mythics are double-colored, which makes it very difficult to splash, which is an understandable feeling to have, and most of the time you'd be correct. However, in this format, you can really push your mana bases, and you can splash double off-color cards, especially because Jack-O-Lantern is just so strong. Uh, you can play a base two-color deck like this, base blue-green. You splash white for a couple cards, and then, all right, I'm already splashing white for a couple strong cards. Why don't I just splash some double white cards, too, and play some... Well, this deck doesn't have any jack-o'-lanterns, but you can imagine how strong it would be if it did. It, it, it does have four eccentric farmers to get the uh, the lands back. And decks like these are, are pretty common. I've had a lot of decks like this that I would almost never, ever consider splashing a double off-color card, but I think in this format you can. And another thing that makes it possible is that you're not... It's not it doesn't have a cost. Normally, if you want to splash in a format, it has a cost. You have to play a card that you otherwise normally wouldn't. That's not always true in this format, because Eccentric Farmer is a card that I will play if I'm green regardless. And then it also fixes your mana. Same with Jack-O-Lantern. I'm not excited to play it, but I've played it in two color decks before, and I'll play it in two color decks again, because it's Graveyard Hate, uh, it's fixing for when you get mana screwed even in your two color deck, uh, and then it also happens to fix you. So that makes a big difference to why you can actually double off color or regular splash more often than normal. I think that's 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 main it for the pillars of the format. I think those are the two things that I really wanted to get across and will use later. It's just the speed of the format and how important and relevant splashing is and how you should probably be doing it more. So with that, let's get into individual colors. I think everybody knows that blue is the strongest color. It should be pretty easy to see why as you go through the, the common list. It has the most playable commons. It has the strongest commons. It has the best two drop in the set, uh, Beethoven Angler, which is important because white does do pretty aggressive stuff. Uh, it has the most cards that are actually strong from your graveyard, right? Like it just has two actively strong cards that you want to self mill, and they're self mill in other colors than blue. Like there's a bunch of reasonable rate interaction, like Revenge of the Round and Flip the Switch, that also just have 
Tutu Zombie with a decayed stapled onto it. Uh, and we'll establish this now because I will be referring it to in the future. A 2-2 Zombie in basically every deck you're going to draft is going to be deal 2 damage to your opponent. So think of it as such. Okay? But if you, you can imagine, flip the switch, counter spell plus deal 2 damage. That's that's a rare. That's that's uh, one blue-red rare that counter to spell and deal 2 damage to your opponent. So this is that, but it's a common. Obviously, that's not a completely fair comparison. You're doing a lot of stretches there, but it shows you that these cards are a lot stronger than you think. Because at first, when I looked at them, I was like, oh, four mana, put a card on top or bottom, but they get to choose. That's not very good. Uh, but the extra two damage, it comes up a lot. If you're out on board, it just pushes to your advantage so hard. Uh, what else to make Splue strong, if you're not convinced already? Uh, Startle, I guess. Oh, yeah, Startle. Uh, we'll talk about it later because it's a very individually strong card and very underrated. Uh, but Startle is actually a very key deck to this blue decks. Because if you think about what it does, you treat the 2-2 the two -two zombie as dealing 2 damage. 2 mana deals 2 damage to your opponent's face, draw a card. That's reasonable. Then see some play in some deck. Okay, well you can also give minus 2 mana 0 if they're attacking with a creature you can't block. Okay, 2 mana, gain 2 life, deal 2 damage, draw a card. That's pretty crazy. Uh, then you also have the flexibility of it being a combat trick that draws a card if they make a block where minus 2 minus 0 would, 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 would do something. And all that adds up to this being just a very strong card that cantrips, smooths out your draws, and it's just so strong. Because you're, like, happy to play it on turn two to cycle, make some two, two damage for later, and you're happy to save it if you have another two drop to uh, get some value out of it later. Which is what I mean by, by smoothing. Whereas in these blue-black decks, like I'm about to talk about, and these other mid-range decks, you don't really have a choice of how to order your spells because you don't have uh, cantrips or filtering and whatnot. All right, blue's the strongest color. Uh, I think blue-black is the weakest of the blue archetypes. It is still strong because blue is broken, but despite all of the data, I am of the opinion that blue-black is the weakest uh, color combination that includes blue. So first of all, this is why I want to establish that mid-range was bad. This is a mid-range deck. The only things you really get out of black are a bunch of strong removal, and I'll note, there is a lot of strong removal. There's Defense Straight and Olivia's Mad Eye Ambush and... Where is it? The Bone Shards card. Uh, and Eaten Alive. That's a lot of strong removal. Uh, but you kind of already have access to that with blue. You have a lot of strong interaction with, with Revenge of the Round, the Counterspell, Locked in the Cemetery, etc. So you don't really need that. It's a little bit better, and you have access to more removal, but you don't need removal that badly in the format, and these aren't really helping you smooth out your draws or filter or whatever. You get some strong individual creatures, like Diagraph Horde. Again, if we're treating the zombies as 2 damage, 4 mana, 5 mana, 3, 4, that shoots your opponent in the face for 4. Pretty damn strong. Uh, and it also is some Graveyard Hate, which is very strong in the format. I'm certainly not going to be hating on Diagraph Horde. Uh, I just don't think that black is very strong, even though it has Diagraph Horde in it. And even though it has a lot of individually strong cards, and it looks like it would work well, it doesn't. And I'm also going to try and explain why I believe the data shows that these cards are good. And the reason is because they're simple cards. A lot of these are simple, generically good cards uh, that work very well with the other blue cards if you are just trying to draft a mid-range deck. And that's what a lot of, uh, that's what the average arena player is doing. They're just drafting the, the average deck, trying to read some signals, trying to draft some strong cards, and blue-black is the strongest thing to do if you're not drafting these high-synergy, greedy mana-based decks. I think that that's, that, that's, that's a, big, uh, a big thing that makes data fallible, is that different things are better depending on who you're playing against and uh, how strong you are as a player, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. I think that's the main thing I want to talk about with black. Even though the cards are all strong, it just plays out clunkily. I don't have any pictures, unfortunately, because I was uh, double queuing. I was both playing Arena and watching lecture recordings, uh, and I forgot to take pictures. But I will note that if you remember the statistic, I didn't get seven wins with three drafts. Well, all those drafts were blue black. <laughs> and I didn't do horribly with them. I didn't two three with them. I just couldn't quite get to seven wins before variants caught up to me. Because you're playing this mid range deck, you don't have a lot of filtration uh, or smoothing like the other archetypes do, with cards like Organ Hoarder and Eccentric Farmer and Cheap Removal and all this good stuff, looting. You don't have that. You have a bunch of removal, too much removal even. Uh, and so a lot of games, you're going to get, somebody's going to curve out on you, and you're just going to get run over because you don't really have the tools to deal with that. You can't afford to play that many two drops without giving up a lot of light game equity. And sometimes you're going to float out and die because you didn't quite get enough damage. You removed their things. They, <laughs> disturb, they got them back with Disturb. <laughs> uh, and then you die. And that happens a lot more than you'd think, and that's how I didn't get 7 wins, is I would get 4-3 or 5-3, because in too many games, I would just get mana screwed and lose. And while the first, and honestly even the second time, I was inclined to think, oh, this is just variance, everybody says blue-black is strong, uh, my third draft, I made sure to actively think about it. Think about how the play patterns were working out, and why I was losing, and why I wasn't losing with other decks. And when I really thought about it, I realized 
the variance is avoidable. This this flood screw variance is avoidable if you play decks with better filtration, better late games, and just cards that provide more consistency. And it's pretty much impossible to do that with blue black. Eventually, I started doing with better blue black because I came to the conclusion that it's not very strong, so I'll only play it if it's very open. That's helpful. Uh, but also, you need to play it as an aggro deck. Despite being a stereotypical control colors, blue black is an aggro deck in this format. You basically just use all of these cards that create zombies, and you try to curve out with them, get some chip damage in with your, your creatures, and then close out with the zombies plus some removal spells. And that's how I play the deck. Uh, I don't think you can, you can consistently try to play it as a control deck. So I think blue black is actually one of the two aggressive archetypes that I'm happy to play. But you should be keeping that in mind while you are drafting blue black. Anything else to talk about about blue black? I don't believe so. Oh, I guess yeah. I mean, in case you weren't aware, this is a very very disgusting card. Uh, this is the a staple of the aggro deck. You just discard into any two drop into sacking is fine, just because you're attacking with a four four on turn three and you didn't lose card advantage. But in particular, this card into novice occultist or even better. Uh, startle, another startle synergy, is just in a turn three sack. This is pretty gross. And then if you follow that up by a removal spell that you probably have lots of access to, they just take so much damage. Like, they take four damage on turn three because they probably can't block it uh, profitably. And then the next turn you kill their thing, they take another four. And then they have four or five mana, and they can probably finally answer it. By that point, they've just lost so much life to this card, and you, even, you, you haven't even sacrificed any card advantage to put a four-four in play and get all that chip damage in. And then it's pretty easy to close the game out with some zombies. Um, I think that's about it. Rotten Reunion is stronger than you think. It just does a lot of face damage in while you're playing an aggro deck, and also is decent value as a graveyard hate card. If you have Diagraphs Hordes, don't take it as highly, because you'll already have graveyard hate. If you don't, you should play one or two to have some graveyard hate. Uh, Mind Rot sucks, because there's a bunch of flashback cards and graveyard energies. Yeah, I think that's about it. Alright, let's move on. Oh, I... Why did I have this? Oh, man. Should have practiced rehearsed more. Um, oh yeah, I just want to make a comparison of like the black, like if you're playing black as a mid-range or control deck and you compare it to these other decks that just get for free these great two drops that also are value in a late game, it's just hard to imagine why you would want to play blue black, even though you get a bunch of like cards and the zombies stapled onto them. Who cares? Because if you're on the back foot, you can't make use of these zombies because you're the one getting pressured and then they just do two damage to their face and you can't guarantee that you're the aggressor. Or if you try to be the control deck uh, more actively, then you just don't get access to a lot of these cards. So you're going to have to play it as an aggro deck. And yeah. Okay, let's talk about red. I am going to talk about red a little bit, and then I'm going to link you to some Ryan Sachs content who explains it a lot better than I do. So red is a spells archetype. The best red common is Festival Crasher. Yes, yes, I know. It's a Festival Crasher. It looks so unplayable. I promise you it is. Uh, I'll explain why, and <laughs> hopefully you'll believe me by the end. The the, the 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 loose explanation is that it's a very strong two-drop. It blocks very well, especially against blue-black, which is still very popular on Arena. Uh, and it's just so hard for your opponent to interact with this card in combat at all. It's so easy to make this a 3-3 or a 5-3 that it's very hard for them to block. And then if that wasn't enough, like, yeah, whatever, they play a 3-3 and they block with it. Okay, well, Startle. <laughs> Guess what? Startle's back. This card's great. Uh, you start another creature, you've eaten it for free, you've got a bunch of tempo, you've gotten a 2-2 for damage, and you've drawn a card. And that's just absurd, that combination. Uh, also, it just pushes damage very fast with, uh, I don't remember the name of it, but Opt, the new Opt that puts in your graveyard, Consider, I think. And then you can kill their stuff pretty easily with the abundance of red, red removal of Moon Ranger Slash. Uh, what else we got? Burn the Accursed, etc. The other red common, again, I know, believe me, I promise, uh, is Tavern Ruffian. <laughs> yes, this is the other very strong red creature. And the way that red plays out typically is it's a spell deck that works around Festival Crasher and Tavern Ruffian. Typically, you'll be red-blue, uh, and you'll want to have a couple other cards that care about instant sorceries. And then, obviously, to make those cards good, you have to make a, your deck have a high quantity of instant sorceries. Okay, well, now you need to actually kill your opponent, right? Now that your deck's full of instant sorceries, you need all your threats to be very impactful. Which is why I believe Tavern Ruffian is actually a very strong card in these decks, and Famished Foragers, despite being objectively a more powerful card, is not. So the way these, these decks and these games play out is you want to put single your threats in play that can kill your opponent basically by themselves, maybe in combination with something else and some chip damage, and then you use them plus cheap removal plus burn to finish your opponent off. Or if you're playing versus Dagger deck, you have the option to use these as a defensive option because it's a 2-5 and it's a 1-3 that gets bigger sometimes. And then the big thing that Red has access to is it has access to a lot of removal, some of which happens to be burned. Moon Ranger Slash is a great card, uh, although 
because most people are playing blue black you need to actively put a card that has day bound in play so that you can switch day to night even if they kill it which is another reason tavern narfian is quite good and then burn the curse is also a very strong removal spell the exile comes up a lot the two damage comes up a lot it being inst an instant just comes up a lot i forgot to talk about this earlier but i guess i'll mention it now cards that are instants Obviously, instants are stronger than sorceries, but even more so in this format because they give you control over whether you want to be there or not. That doesn't include every instant. Instants that are only good during your turn don't really count because, or only good during your opponent's turn because you don't have the flexibility to choose, do I want day to go to night or not? Do I want to double spell this turn or not? Etc. Uh, cards like counter spells, combat tricks, they don't quite count because you don't have the option to, you don't have a choice if that makes sense. Whereas Burn the Accursed, you could play it on your turn to kill their guy. Or you could let day become night if you want to, and then play it on their turn. So you just have, have the option, which is much stronger. So we have that. And that's about it. Red doesn't actually get a ton of great commons on its own. Neon Knight's Rush is actually quite good. Better than it looks. <clears throat> Immolation's okay. Uh, Electric Revelation is actually not a stable, but it, it helps smooth your deck out quite a bit. Arn Metalist is playable, but not great. And then let's show some examples to really show how, the, how these decks work. So this is this is my deck. Uh, four Festival Crashers, very few creatures, four, two Storm Crelixes. And you might be tempted to say, oh, sure, you just got the nuts and it was super open. Which is kind of true, but you also have to be aware that if Festival Crashers start wheeling, you have to take them. Uh, and even though I noted that Festival Crasher is the best route in common, I will still take cards like Moonranger slash over it and this over it because Festival Crashers wheel and these don't. So yeah, we have a deck like this, and Need Night's Rush was also quite good, and it just played out super cleanly. Honestly, I was kind of surprised. This was my, my third or fourth red-blue draft, and I was like kind of ready to give up on it, but this deck really re-inspired me to just take Festival Crashers more highly and draft these kind of curve-centric decks that use singular threats plus lots of interaction. For this one, yeah, uh, Ryan Sachs. The other thing you can do with red is play red-green spells. Typically, I try to avoid red-black and red-white, neither of which are very strong. Red-green spells is more focused on creatures rather than singular threats. So red-green, you can actually play like kind of crappier creatures because you have Shadow Beast Sighting, which is both an instant or sorcery to trigger things that care about instant sorceries, and it's a creature. Whereas blue doesn't have cards like that. It plays like that. If you want... F so first of all, you should just try it out. I didn't do a great job of ex explaining this. Uh, so if you don't believe me, I will not have my healings hurt, but you should try it out for yourself. If you end up agreeing with me, then... Great, you learned something for us in the format. If you don't, you wasted a draft or two or whatever. And don't force it, just if you're getting Festival Crashers late, if you aren't seeing a great archetype, then you move into red, baby. And then I will also be linking you to a Ryan Sachs article in the description that you should go read, because he explains all this very much very much better than me and has played a lot more of these red spelled X than I have. Okay, uh, and then we'll talk about white a little bit. White is an interesting color. White is the only color... I really like playing as aggressively. Blue-black, I guess, kind of. Uh, White-black is the other thing, main thing that I like, and I'm, like, open to white-red, but not excited about it. White-green, just do not, do not play white-green. And white doesn't get a lot of super strong commons on its own for aggressive decks. It gets Candlegrove Witch, which, which is okay. It looks like a card that would be super good. A 2-mana 2-2 that has flying any amount of the time is a strong card, but it just doesn't play out that well because there's stronger things to be doing in the format. So it doesn't get a ton of strong stuff on its own. Uh, it mostly plays... Disturb cards and flyers, and kind of just tries to curve out and use cards like Gavany Silversmith to push their push it to advantage and just kill people. Hard to explain again. Which I had a picture. I had a very strong white black deck. I was happy about. Usually these decks will make good use of the uncommons. In particular, if you get Dual Craft Tamer or Gavany Dawnguard, are both very strong. Odrix Outrider as well. They they make these decks possible. And then you combine these with the black cards that I talked about earlier. Um, the Horror, the Awakener, the Traveler isn't great in this archetype. It's better in like blue black aggro because you can flip it from night to day more easily. But even if you're just any black deck, will usually have some instant speed removal, and then you can use that to flip this and get a good tempo boost. And yeah, you'll just play play some sort of white black deck normally. White blue is also quite strong and can be played aggressively, but typically you want to play it more mid rangey. I very rarely have strictly white blue decks. Usually they're like some mix of white, blue, and green, like this deck and this deck, which I guess we'll talk about more in depth later. Uh, so that's typically how these white, white, blue decks end up. But occasionally you will draft a deck that can actually be aggro. Normally it will involve having, where is it? Devoted Graph Keepers. Uh, this card is just so strong in an aggressive deck. The, the face mode is the tap a creature whenever you cast a card from your graveyard. It's just so good in an aggressive deck, as is the 3-1 flyer that can't block non-flying non creatures. 
It's strong no matter where you are, but it's very strong in an aggro deck. Yeah, I feel like I haven't done a great job of explaining exactly how to play white, but basically it's the it's 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 the, it's the color that's not that strong on its own, but has a lot of things you can do with it and plays pretty good support just because it has, it's deep and has a lot of commons. It has the disturb creatures for those type of decks. It has the aggressive uh, cards like Gavity Dongard for the aggro decks, and then it has Candle Trap. I was going to talk about it a little bit more later, but I guess I'll mention it now. Candle Trap is a very strong card. It does not look like it, but <laughs> it is sourced to flash shares. Again, not a fair comparison, but eh, it's a reasonable comparison. I guess we'll just get into it now. So you play this on a two or three toughest creature. Uh, it can't deal damage for the rest of the game, uh, so they can chump block it and gain some life. And then it sorts plus shares. And then if it happens to be a creature that you actually need to remove from the battlefield, well, you have the ability to eventually, but with Coven. Uh, and if you have to hit a creature with big toughness, yes, they might block with it more than once. It's just not that big a deal. Like, they'll gain some life. Or that, if you have to let them gain some life, then you're happy you have one mana removal. And if you have the mana to actually exile their thing, well, then you don't have to let them gain life. And it just plays out pretty well. I think that's about it for white. Oh, uh, Sunset, Sunset Revelry is a very strong card. It doesn't look it, but it just plays out nicely, especially with the uh, the, the multiple one-mana artifacts that are actually playable in the format. Both Jack-O-Lantern and Silver Bowl get cards out of your hand, and then you play this, and it can sometimes both draw a card and make the one ones, which is obviously the ideal scenario. I guess on the topic of Jack-O-Lantern and Silver Bolt, where are they? Uh, here they are, yeah. On the topic of Jack-O-Lantern and Silver Bolt, these are both decent cards on their own, and I forgot to mention this when I was talking about Jack o' Lantern earlier, but the fact that it's a one-mana artifact that you can choose when you want to play is actually very strong because day and night, it's not quite as... It doesn't get the boost that instants get, like I talked about earlier, but it does get a boost in the sense that if you have an instant that you want to leave up, you can play Jack o' Lantern and pass, leave up your instant without making day to night. If you want to make night to day, well, then you play this with another spell, and either way, you're pretty happy. Same with Silver Bolt, plus a little extra with Bolt, you can uh, skip your turn three to or turn four to kill something without having to play a spell, which is, again, very strong. Yeah. All right, so we are done with white. Let's move on to green. Green is another support color just because the commons aren't very deep. The reason to play green is, is eccentric farmers. I don't know why I couldn't pronounce that. Eccentric farmer is the strongest green common. It's the second strongest common in the set. Possibly stronger than organ hoarder, but dubious. Uh, at least in terms of raw power level, it's just completely absurd. It's a 3 by 2 3 it almost always draws a card, and usually it draws more than one card because you've also milled 3, which will get you a, some value. And that's just absurd. It also fixes your mana, it just does everything that you want it to do. The issue is that green is not deep. All of the other commons are shit. So, what do we do about that? Well, we kind of like half play green as a support color. And sometimes, usually, my green decks will be splashing another color, either to play some rares, or even more commonly, I'll just be playing green for like this card and one or two other green cards and then I'll just be playing another color for even more green cards or even more non-green cards right yes some cards are okay uh sighting's like okay but I think it's a little overrated you just like never flash back this card it just never comes up that you have seven mana for a four four and a four mana four four isn't that strong uh the duel for dominance is all right bird admirer is actually pretty good because it blocks super well and usually I pair green with blue and I want to be able to stall the late game this does a pretty good job of that Blocking flyers as well. But overall, there just aren't a lot of cards, and I'm excited to put my deck in green, and so I won't move into it that often, unless I get eccentric farmers. Excuse me. And I'm trying to talk about, uh, this is the kind of thing I was talking about where you just kind of splash green. Like, is this even considered a green deck? <laughs> Maybe, because I'm playing Tapping at the Window, which is a pretty shitty card, even though it is green. So if I was only splashing green, I wouldn't play this. But at the same time, I only have four green cards and five white cards. And a lot of time, that's what your green decks will look like. You'll play it for some eccentric farmers or some multicolored cards. And whatever your deck is missing in terms of, like, sell, like, I wanted some more self bill, so I put a tapping at the window. You know. Um, yeah. I guess that's about it. Questions are welcome in the comments. And beyond that, let's talk about some over and underrated cards. First of all, Brutal Cathar. Uh, this card's broken. Don't. I don't care what colors you are, you should never you should never pass this card. If you see this card, you, I I very rarely say this, you should never pass this card. Ever. I'm I'm not being hyperbolic. I'm not. Just don't pass this card. I don't care how bad it makes your mana, you're playing this card. Okay? 
the worst case of this card is uh, whatever that Fiend Hunter, that card, yeah, Fiend Hunter, basically. 3 out of 2 2 that gets rid of a creature and no, they kill it. But I have just played against and with this card so many times where it just wins the game on its own. They, if you if they cannot kill it, they cannot win the game. It's so, unless they're absurdly ahead on board already by the time you play it, it's so difficult to stop this from just eating all of their creatures. And then just eventually they die. I've had so many games that were just unwinnable, but for a Brutal Cathar. And if at any point in the entirety of the game they could bounce this, kill this, do anything to it, I, they would win the game. But they couldn't, so I won. Uh, and then, of course, the worst, the downside of this is the worst case is that they can kill it. Well, you've played a 3 by 2 2 that they had to use a removal spell on and that it made their creature not involved in combat for one turn. That's pretty strong. All right, that rent out of the way. Candle Trap, talked about it a little bit already. Yeah, it's pretty strong. You, you just put it on a pretty much any creature. There aren't actually that many creatures in the format that you feel that you need to exile or remove from the battlefield completely. So the one mana mode of this is actually pretty strong. The damage prevention... It's understandable to think this card is weak, because in the past, cards that give Defender have been weak, but these preventive, prevent all combat damage text is actually very, very relevant, because it means that you can go wide into their stuff, and it means that their guy can't trade off. So, like, it can chump block, but who cares? You kill their creature, and they've gained some life, and you got a big mana advantage. And then, if it does happen to be a disturbed creature that you need to exile, or a creature with text, well, it's not that hard to get Covenant and exile it, and then you paid four mana for a removal spell. I'm pretty happy with that either way. Uh, Chaplain of Arms, I think, is pretty overrated. I think it's a weaker card than Lunark Veteran, which we'll get into later, but I think is a strong card. Uh, one mana, one one first strike is a lot worse than a one one that gains a bunch of life, and even though the backside's slightly stronger, it's just so much mana. Like, you can play this card, but don't take it highly, even though it looks like it'll be strong. Uh, Dual Craftainer is the strongest uncommon in the set, maybe tied with a Morbid Opportunist. Yes, I know how crazy this card is. This card is crazier, I guarantee you. Uh, it just kills people out of nowhere. It's pretty easy to coven, and when you do, giving a creature double strike every turn is just so strong. It just makes combat so impossible for your opponent. It makes racing very difficult. You have a flyer, which absolutely murders them. Uh, a lot of the removal in the set doesn't actually kill, so having this just sitting on the battlefield is really, really strong. And it can give itself double strike, too. It just does everything that you want it to. And it's a 4 mana 3 3 first strike, which blocks pretty well if you're on the back foot. All around great card. Don't pass it. Play it. Splash it, importantly. It's a great card to splash. Gavin Dunn card, also very strong. Uh, I'm not sure if people over or underrate this, but I just want to mention that it's a very strong card. It's a basically this you can say this you can pretend this last line, this huge box of text that looks for a creature is draw point eight of a card. I don't know whatever the probability is that you draw a card off of it, and then you're pretty happy to play this card right through meta three three ward one that draws a card whatever day becomes night or night becomes day, even if it's only point eight of the time. That's still very strong. Uh, Lunark veteran, yeah, we I'm sure if you're on Twitter you've seen the big discussion early in the format. Uh, Mike Seacrest does not like this card. I think it's good on Arena. I haven't played a lot of Magic Online. It might be weaker there because the average card quality is lower because all the drafters know what they're doing. Uh, on Arena, a lot of the times, it blocks pretty well. The life gain is important. Uh, and sometimes you need extra disturb creatures because you're self-milling or looting or doing whatever, and then you're happy to just pay two mana for 1-1 one, one after you looted it away. Uh, Fading Hope is definitely an underrated card. Bounce spells... I don't love the two mana bounce spell in this format just because two mana bounce is so expensive, but Unsummon is very strong in the format, and the scry one, it comes up a decent amount. I've had a lot of scenarios where I've wanted to bounce my own creature, and having access to this was very nice. I had a lot of scenarios where I wanted to bounce my opponent's creature, and having this for one mana was very nice. Hard to explain more than that, but just leave it at this is a pretty strong card that you should be taking. Not highly, but if you don't have if you're light on removal or you feel like you need some extra tempo, this is a great pickup. Or if you feel like you are light of win cons, it actually is another good, good place to pick it up because it can bounce your own win con. Oh, that reminds me. I didn't talk about this earlier, but for these green decks that have a lot of eccentric farmers, you need a way to not deck yourself. Because even though in most cases you won't deck yourself, a lot of the times you'll have to play in a way such that you need to use your resources inefficiently to try and get your opponent dead before, they, before you deck them. And I've actually had quite a few games where even though my deck was definitely much stronger than my opponent on card quality. Uh, I just milled myself too much with these and Organ Hoarders, and I had to play the game, I, and I had to use my resources inefficiently to try and get them dead, and they had some removal spells, and then I decked myself, and I was sad. And while it doesn't feel great, sometimes you just gotta put a... Well, fuck, I forgot to get the card up. What's called? Devious Cover-Up? Yeah. Uh, Devious Cover-Up. Does this work? Yeah, sometimes you, I mean, I, not not the right art, but you get what I mean. You don't love it, but sometimes you gotta put this card in your deck if you don't have a way to to make sure you actually are killing your opponent. Uh, you put one of it in your deck. Yes, it sucks when you draw against the aggro decks. It's a dead card, basically. But it's one dead card, 
and versus the mirror matches and other control decks, it has a huge impact because you're going to go through your whole deck and you're going to find this. And versus the aggressive decks, it has a minimal impact because it's only one card and you're not going to draw it that often. Um, yeah, so that's the reason Fading Hope is good. Larder Zombie, a little good, a little better than people give it credit for. People thought it was unplayable at first. Then uh, somebody made a Twitter thread about it. They were definitely right. It's a pretty strong card. A 1-3 is a nice stat line in the format. And self-milling yourself is quite uh, relevant because you have Disturbed Creatures and Flashback cards and all that good nonsense. Uh, and then also just could scry once or twice during their end step. Not great, but I'll play it if I'm short on cheap creatures that block. Uh, like if I'm playing a blue deck that didn't get a lot of Shipwreck Scepters and Disturbed Creatures or a blue deck that doesn't want those cards, like a blue-black deck, and I want my blue-black to be control deck, which doesn't happen very often, but when it does, you can play Larder Zombie, and it's decent. Lock in the Cemetery, I don't, again, not sure if this is un if this is uh, rated correctly, but I've gotten a lot of them quite late. I think it's not great, but better than people give it credit for. Uh, it's not very good in the blue-black decks, which is probably why it gets passed a lot, but in the blue-red... That's not very good in the blue-red decks either. Okay, it's good in exactly these these blue-green-white shells. And it's very good in these blue-green-white shells. Uh, they're usually very good at putting cards in their graveyard, and then it's just two-mana removal that you're very happy to have. Uh, but yeah, it's not great in blue-black or, or, or blue-white. <laughs> Chipwreck Sifters is very underrated. Like I talked about earlier, if you evaluate this card, discarding the disturbed card, it's just completely absurd. You play the two-mana 2-3, two, they drew you a card. Yeah, that's... that's, just, that's a, I'll let that sink in. You just play the two-mana 2-3, two, they drew you a card. That's absurd. It's just, this is fucking absurd. Like, I don't know what else to say other than that's absurd. And then it gets better of that. If you have multiples of these, <laughs> if you have multiple of these, it just smooths out the consistency so much, and the best case gets higher. So you say, okay, well, what if you don't draw disturbed cards? Okay, well, then it's a two-meta one-two that loots. I'm not happy to have that in my deck. Well, that's why you have multiples, because it also gets countered when you discard spirits. So you draw the two of these and no disturbed cards. Well, you loot one away to the other, you got a two-meta two-three. Let's go. Uh, even better, and then in the top, top case, you have two Disturbed Creatures, and two Shipper Acceptors, uh, your opponent just dies. Two minute two three, discard a Disturbed card. Next turn, two minute two three, discard a Disturbed card. Your other two minute two three gets countered, because it's whenever. And then they die. <laughs> to card advantage or tempo or whatever. Uh, Startle, we talked about a little bit already, but yep, it's quite a strong card when you think about the evaluation, and you just play it more often. Uh, even I honor it, honestly, because it's just so hard to evaluate this card, uh, because cards in the past, like card, like there was, there was a card in AFR that just was this card, but it didn't make a zombie, and it was unplayable, but... Dealing two damage to your opponent makes a big difference on a two-mana card, uh, and it's quite strong in this format. Opportunist. I don't know why I put it on here. It's probably rated correctly. It's it's very, very strong. Like I said, it's it's the best, or maybe slightly better than... Maybe tied for Dual Craft Trainer in terms of best uncommon. Very strong card, draws a lot of cards, should be taking it over a good amount of rares. Same as Dual Craft Trainer. Uh, Burn the Accursed. I don't know if it's underrated. I think red's just a little underrated as a whole because people aren't playing it in the right context. But in particular, Burn the Accursed doesn't even need to go in these red uh, these these red spell decks. You can just splash it pretty easily. Like, if I picked up a bunch of Jack o Lanterns in pack 1 and 2, and I don't find anything to splash, and I need some removal or burst or whatever, take a Burn the Accursed. It's fine. It exiles the creature. It does some damage to their face. It does most of the things that you want it to. Thangblade Brigand. Um, oh, same deal. It's obviously very strong in these red decks because you flip it and it's very hard to block and it's big. Uh, I'm actually pretty happy to splash this. It doesn't splash super well off Jackal Lantern because it has an activated ability, but it splashes pretty well off Evolving Wilds and Eccentric Farmers and whatnot just because even if you only have one red source and you can only activate it once, it attacks as a 4-4 four, four first strike. That's pretty good. And then if you're able to flip it, this 5-mana mode is quite strong even if off, off, off only a single red mana. Uh, Flame Channeler is very underrated in the red spell deck particularly because the reason for that is because of another card that I forgot to add that is actually quite strong. What's it? Oh, uh, shit. Where is it? Let's just go down here. No! I didn't prepare enough. Uh, Neonite Rush, which does not look like a very good card, but it is, even though I very rarely play Vampires. I'll just play this card for three mana. It deals one damage to one of their creatures. It does damage to their face, and it draws a card. And when you get cards like this very late, and you get the Moon Rager Splashes that you pick early, and you get the Burn the Curse, this is a two mana, two, three, three, three that will draw you cards. Yep. <laughs> It's very good. It's a reason to go into red. Oh, no. My camera. Uh, sorry about that. And we're back. Okay. Almost done, I promise. Uh, Dryad's Revival. The reason Dryad's Revival is good is the same reason that I think you need Devious Cover-Up. It makes it a lot easier to not mill yourself out, because even if you accidentally mill this, if you have mill Cover-Up accidentally, well, then you can't play it. If you mill this accidentally, well, then you just get back your best card, and it's probably enough to kill them. Also, I will just play it if I have... 
enough good cards to get back. I don't love it in blue-green. Uh, if you're splashing red for cheap removal or black or whatever, then it's pretty good. Just because getting back cheap removal, this is strong. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, Farmer, we talked about it already, but just in case you were wondering, it is the best or second best common in the set to Organ Hoarder. You should be taking it as such. You should not be passing it. Uh, I've gotten way too many of these way too late to not include it on the list, even though I'm sure I've already talked your ear off about how good this card is. Lastly, we talked about this a little bit as well. Uh, Shadow Beast Sighting is a little overrated, in my opinion. Uh, the format of 4-4, not great. There's a lot of bounce put on top of your library from, from blue. Uh, the flashback mode very rarely comes up just because 7 mana is so much mana. And by the time you get to turn 7, usually you either want flyers or card advantage or just something other than a 7 mana 4-4. Like, that just isn't where you want to be. And then if you mill it off Farmer, yeah, like, it's free to have access to, but it's just not that great. Like, I'm obviously always going to play it, but I don't take it very highly in, in my green decks pretty much. Like, I pretty much never take it unless it's already wheeled. Uh, Jack and Lantern we talked about a lot. Silver Bolt, yeah, it's a very good removal spell. Uh, you don't think it, it is, but it just plays out nicely. The one mana is easy to weave in. There's the upside of being able to have more control over in the night day. And usually three damage is a good stat line or a good break point for killing things. And most of the things that have more than three toughness are werewolves that you get to kill anyways. So, not great. I'm not excited to play it, but if I'm short on removal, if I'm short on ways to actually remove creatures from the battlefield, even if I have removal, I'll put it in my deck. I'll be not unhappy about it. Oh, sorry about that. All right. And lastly, I want to talk about all of the cards that make decayed creatures. Because uh, I think a lot of them are under or overrated. A good mix of both. Diagraph Horde. Uh, well, rated correctly, actually. Very strong. 5 mana, 3, 4 that does 4 damage and graveyard hate. Very strong. Little underrated, if anything. Take highly and consider splashing. If you're a deck that's trying to pressure them, but it doesn't happen that often that decks that are splashing are also decks that are trying to pressure them. Uh, yeah. Talking about automation, uh, very, very, very overrated. I cannot stress enough that this card is not very good. I, I very rarely have blue decks that want to put this card in it. Even if you are blue-black and you are aggressive, I'm still taking either of these over Falcon Abomination. Either of these blue cards. Flip the switch or revenge. Uh, Windrake is just such a terrible style line in the format, and the fact that it hits their face for two damage does not matter that much. Just isn't. Like, I don't know what else to, to, to explain. It looks like it would be good. It just doesn't lay out very well. Uh, flip the switch. Hard to evaluate flip the switch as well. I think it's underrated because people don't realize how that that it is ionized, counter and deal two damage. But at the same time, I don't think that counter and deal two damage is good in this format. So it's hard for me to describe. Uh understand what what exactly the card is doing, take it in the decks where counter deal to damage is good, pass it in the decks that don't. If you are drafting, especially if you're drafting multiple of these, you need to make sure you have enough two drops because this card is not good when you're on the back foot. So you need to make sure that you're on the front foot and you actually get to leverage the counter aspect and the make a zombie aspect rather than just being behind and passing turn and giving them the option to pass turn back or play their shitty spell into your card that you're forced to use your counter on. In particular, I think this card's good if you are a deck that has lots of instants. I wanted to talk about this earlier. Something I picked up from Ryan Sachs, whose article you should read, by the way. Link is still in the description. Is that... Oh, where is it? I'll just look it up. The 5 mana 3-3 flash? Where is it? No! Ah... 5 mana 3-3 three, three flash is a little bit better than people give it credit for, and the reason is that the way to make some of your blue-red decks, and just blue decks in general, strong is to leave up a lot of instants, which is another thing that Flip the Switch is, is helpful for. You can leave up this card, and the deal 3 damage spell, or Revenge of the Drowned, or the 3-3, three, three, and then you have the option to counter a spell, but if you don't, you don't lose a bunch of tempo because you play something else, you know? Uh, Procession, I don't, I don't know, it's an uncommon, I don't know how people rate this shit, whatever. Uh, Hobbling Zombie, a little bit underrated. Not great, though, because the decks that want 2-2 Death Touch do not want, or they want, but they don't make very good use of the Zombie with Decayed. That said, it's a decent and aggressive card if you have flyers to back it up with, because you race in the air, especially the 2-minute 2-1 flyer that can't block. Uh, no way out, we talked about it already. I don't know if it's overrated, but it's not a playable card. Revenge, I think it's still a little bit underrated. People are taking cards like Falcon Abomination and stuff over it when they really shouldn't be. Revenge that around is, is very, very strong. It's not removal, but... A good amount of the times where you need removal, Revenge of the Drowned will also do the job because it will put them on the back foot enough or just kill them so that you can ignore whatever their strong bomb or whatever it is that you needed to kill, if that makes sense. Rotten Reunion also talked about a little bit. Uh, good in these aggressive decks, these blue-black and black-white aggressive decks. Good pickup if you don't have Graveyard Hate already. And then Startle, great card. Really, really good card. You gotta be taking this card more highly. 
it's a staple in a lot of these decks that work out well. That said, don't take it too highly. A lot of the cards that I've... Maybe I should have made more clear. A lot of the cards that I've talked about today being strong, just because I talk about them doesn't mean that people are going to start taking them more highly. So if they're strong cards that are going to wheel, there's not really a ton of point to taking them early just to have them not... Just to have the car, the, the weaker card not wheel. When you can take the weaker card and then wheel this and then have both. So... Even though I believe this card is stronger in a vacuum than Flip the Switch, I will still take Flip the Switch over it because I think it'll wheel. That's true for a decent amount of cards that we talked about today. Mm, I guess that's it. Is that all I'd talk about? I feel like I'm forgetting things, but I don't know what they are, so I guess the video's over. Uh... Oh, uh, Homestead Courage, not great, but in your White Aggro decks, you'll play it. It's fine. Uh, oh, more Crap Behemoth. It's good in very specific decks. It's good in the decks where you're already taxing their removal, so your 7-6 is more likely to stick, and, importantly, you also need to have creatures that you're willing to sack, because obviously you don't want to be paying 7 mana for this card. But in those decks, it goes from being weak to being very, very strong. Hmm... <sighs> Vampire Interloper, not great card, but in, in these white-black aggro decks, it's one of the two drops that I'm most excited to have, uh, just because I can almost always guarantee that I'm going to be the one who's being the aggressor. In particular, it works pretty well with the uh, Lunar Veteran, just because it's so hard to race the Veteran, and then you just have a 2-2 one that's going to deal a lot of chip damage that they can't really uh, block or race. There's not a lot of creatures in the form I think can block a 2-1 flyer, so you don't have to worry that much about it getting... Bricked by a bigger flyer and then just doing nothing because they can't block. Mm, that's it, I guess. Just be aware of... Oh, yeah, we talked about multicolored cards earlier. Uh, be aware that some of the multicolored cards are just weak in general and not worth splashing. Like, Moonrise is not a good magic card. Corpse Cobbles is not usually worth splashing because it's only good with a bunch of decayed creatures. Um, stuff like that. Yeah, all right, that's it. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you made it this far and you aren't subscribed, uh, do it. And links to my other social media and Twitch in the description. All right. Bye, everybody.